I want to ask, is there anybody in this room insane enough not to have enjoyed dinner on the grounds? Is there anybody here that has never been to a dinner on the grounds in a Baptist church? Well, I think all of us would say, amen, it's a wonderful experience. Well, are you aware that the first dinner on the grounds took place in the ministry of Jesus? It's recorded in John chapter 6, better known as the feeding of the 5,000. And John was eyewitness and an ear witness. And here's what he says. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. The great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed to those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was in year. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, said, Philip, where shall we buy bread that these people may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for every one of them to have a little. A denarii was a day's wages in that day. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among such? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in a number of about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, so that nothing is lost. Our sermon this morning is entitled, the lad, the lunch, and the Lord. You know, if you can think about it, this is right by the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Tiberias is just a ways it can be seen. And here this crowd came. Jesus had been healing people. And the word had gotten out that this man is a person that can make a difference in our lives. And so they came and they listened and it was lunchtime, and you know, they didn't have any uh, McDonald's in those days, as you well know. And so how in the world are these people going to be fed? Remember, in this day, the average Galilean ate one meal a day, if he or she were fortunate. So, you know the story. Now, what can we take away from this event the marvelous miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, the only one of the 33 miracles of Jesus that is recorded by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and rightfully so. Well, I'd like for us to think about, walk around five ideas. And the first one's this. First, we should not be overwhelmed by circumstances, for the Lord makes the impossible possible. Vita and I had the opportunity of serving in University Heights Baptist Church in Stillwater for five years. It was a college church one block away from Oklahoma State. We'd have an early service of about 150 people or two. And then the second service, we'd have about 500, 400 of them would be college students. So we had a great ministry and a fun time in those years with those fine collegians. Now, I can recall one Sunday evening, Ed Smith came forward during the invitation. And when he got excited, Ed's a great guy. When he got excited, he would stu 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 stutter. And while the congregation sang about th literally three stanzas of the invitation, Ed told me in so many words, I feel the Lord is calling me to preach. Well, I don't think the Lord ever makes mistakes. But on the way home, I turned to my wife and I said, Honey, how in the world is Ed going to be a preacher when when he gets excited, he has a hard time speaking normally? 
Let me tell you what happened. A month later, we asked Ed, he wanted to be licensed because a small country church north of Stillwater wanted him to come and serve as a student pastor on weekends. And in order to be licensed, he would come before our deacons and share his testimony and say, and it's called to, to preach. Let me tell you something. Ed got up in front of our deacons and spoke just as normal and plain as you and I visited before we had the morning worship service. And I almost fell off the pew. I was astounded. And on the way home, I said, honey, do you realize what we've witnessed? In 1954, Vita and I were invited to go as summer missionaries to Jamaica. Our BSU director, Dr. W.J. Wimpy, said you'll be included in the group. There'll be two students from each state from New Mexico all the way to Virginia. He comes back after the Texas Baptist Collegiate Convention and said, Bill, there's been a mix up. They've already chosen the two from Texas, but Dr. Howard said, if you all can raise the money we would welcome you in the group. And I said, well, how much money are we talking about? He said, $800. Now let me get the picture to you. My wife was working as a school teacher, working nine months for $2,700 in Waco, Texas. We had been married one year. How in the world are we, we were just living hand to mouth, I'd been in a series of youth revivals throughout Texas and Oklahoma. And so I, I said, well, if the Lord wants us there, we'll do everything we know how to do. So I sat down and wrote about 20 letters to churches and told them the situation. Now, let me tell you what kind of money we're talking about. Google comes in handy. I Googled last night, how much would $800 in 1954 be worth today? Would you like to guess? $8,400. So that's what we were facing. <laughs> so in the next three weeks, I want you to know that $1,200 came in the mail. And we were astounded. And I remember my grandmother was a senior adult in her late 70s, not in good health, so before we left, I said, Vita, we didn't need to go out and see Bama because she could leave us while we're down in Jamaica and we'd like to say farewell. So we go out and I say, Bama, let me tell you what exciting happened to us. And I told her the story. With a deadpan, she looked at me and said, what are you so surprised about? God's just doing what he told you he'd do. And I felt about that big. You and I have seen miracles in our lives over the years that seem impossible. Our son tragically had metastatic melanoma and an invasion in his right frontal lobe, and the doctors told us he'd lived less than a year, and he lived 25 more years. God does the impossible possible. Not only that, Jesus can and will use anybody who is willing. Have you ever thought in the New Testament, you know who the Rodney Dangerfield was? The boy. He had a little lunch. How was his family? They were poor. How do you know? Because the rich people would have bread made of wheat. His bread was made of barley. And he had, went on an outing to the sea, perhaps to swim, perhaps to fish. And he was willing to turn loose of his lunch and put it in the hands of the master. And when he did, a marvelous thing happened. And you and I have seen people time and time again that would turn their lives over to the Lord and things marvelous would happen in their lives. Not only that, but a little is a lot in the hands of the Lord. 
Through the years as a pastor, I've witnessed a lot of folk in churchmanship. And you know, it's been amazing to me how some people that seem so insignificant on the whole scene, not like the leadership of the church, not like uh, prominent people in the business community in a city, but these people made all the difference in the world. I'll give you an illustration. June White was singing in the choir in 1968 when we came to Woodmont. June, bless her sweetheart, got a job when her marriage dissolved, reared two fine children, and one of whom you well know, and she was faithful throughout all. I sang in the choir when her, when her funeral happened at Woodmont. The meeting house was dang nigh full of folk. She had been faithful to churchmanship. She had a good attitude. She continued to be a marvelous Christian witness. She was faithful in everything that she did with a good spirit. And our church at Woodmont would have laid down and died every one for her. It's amazing. A little is a lot in the hands of the Lord. Now, a fourth idea. Only bread from Jesus can satisfy the spiritual hunger of our souls. You've heard about the church father named Augustine. He died in AD 430. He was the last of the church fathers. He grew up, as you well know, with a silver spoon in his mouth and hippo. He was a very, very uh, unfortunate delinquent. He tried everything out there, including having an illegitimate child. His father disowned him, and his mother stayed faithful. He tried every avenue open, and then he became a believing Christian. And in his confessions, he wrote, Thou hast made us for thyself, O God, and our souls are restless until we rest in thee. We mentioned going to Jamaica as summer missionaries. When we arrived there, the missionary happened to be the person that baptized Vita, for he was a student at Howard Payne College, and she lived in West Texas, and he was the student pastor. And so we knew Brother McCullough so very, very well. He said, Bill, you and Vita married. Uh, you all are a little bit more mature, and I, I laughed at that, than the other students. I want you to go and spend six weeks at Ora Cabeza on the north coast. For the pastor at Ora Cabeza, Brother O.T. Johnson, is in Belize doing missionary work for the Jamaica Baptist Union. How does that sound? Well, we were happy to do it. So the next day, Saturday morning, we drove over and met Miss Johnson. The church was Ora Cabeza's on the north coast. There's a cliff right here. It's a banana port town. And the church was here, the school was here, and they lived right up here on the manse. And so the first week we were there, we had vacation Bible school. And I'm here to tell you, almost the whole town came. It's amazing. And I had the, se the senior high group, so to speak, but really I had about 40 adults in the group, which is fine. Well, the week went by in a hurry. We had services and a delightful time. After we had parents' night on Friday night, which we used to call, uh, what was that term? Oh, well, anyway, parents' night. <laughs> uh, we go up and sit down in the house on the bluff overlooking the Caribbean, 10 o'clock at night, tuned in WFAA Texaco Star Reporter to find out what's going on in the world because we didn't have a paper, we didn't have television, we didn't have radio, so we were wondering. And I recall as we sat there and listened to the radio, a 17-year-old boy walked up on the porch. Ms. Johnson, the pastor's wife, was a lovely lady, but I never saw her move faster than a snail. She just kind of creeped around. It's hot in Jamaica. She bounced out of that chair like a jack-in-the-box and shot across the floor. I was shocked. 
And the young man at the door says, please, Mom, I want to talk to one of the students. She said, not in here. And I was really surprised. She said, you are an evil man. You will not come in this sacred place. And so I got up and I said, well, Benny, I'll talk to you. She turned to me with fire in her eyes, says, not in here. I said, well, no problem. I'll just go out there. So we walked down the side of the hill, sat down on a big rock. The Caribbean was just about where the pew was. The wind was coming in. The snoon was out. Kind of like moon over Miami in Vaughn Monroe, if you know that song. And I turned to Winston. We had, he had taken us, quote, sea bobbing, as they called it. We went swimming. And we'd gotten to know him pretty well, but we didn't know, his, know who we, we were talking to. We'd just been there a week. He turns to me and said, I've tried all the ways of my friends. I didn't know his background. And none of these Give me satisfaction. I have seen in you four college students this week something that I want for my life. Will you tell me what it is? And I looked at him and I said, Benny, has anybody ever explained to you in language you can understand how you can become a Christian? He said, no, Mon. If you've ever been to Jamaica, everybody's a Mon. And so I shared with him why Christ came, what he did, how he could become a Christian. And I said, are you willing to trust Jesus and confess your sins and follow him as a believer? And he, he shook his head. I said, let's pray. I prayed a prayer and I said, now Benny, you just tell the Lord what you've told me and ask Jesus to come into your heart. And he did. And then he said, amen. And I remember the moon is out and his teeth were so crystal white. He was black as can be as a Jamaican. And he said, I feel different. He had a big smile. I said, Benny, I'm preaching right here in the church because the church building was here and the school was here. I'm preaching Sunday morning there. Would you come forward and trust Christ and profess him Sunday morning? He said, yes, Mom, but I don't have any shoes. I said, that's no problem. I've got another pair. Try these on. I had some loafers on. I took them off. <laughs> of course, he put his foot in there, and he could turn around in them just about. But uh, the long and the short of it, comes Sunday morning, I preached a sermon. Benny came in and sat on the back row. Now, look, the neighborhood was sick and tired of Benny because every Friday night, he at the bar would start a fight and end up in jail. And so when he came to church and some people saw him, you should have seen the looks that would stop a clock. We gave the invitation. He came forward. And the people, it was like a Mexican castanet dance. The vertebrae in their necks as they saw him and the looks they gave him would stop a clock. After they were seated, were seated I said, friends, let me tell you what happened Friday night right out here. The windows were open. And I shared the story. And I said, I know that you as a church will gladly receive Vincent and surround him with love and encouragement. And, and I didn't see any good, uh, any nods, I'll tell you that. And so I said, all of you who would like to receive him into this congregation, please up, lift up your hand. About half the hands went up. After the prayer, he stood there. A few people came by. I went to the back door, and the head deacon came out and said, Mon, you don't know who you're dealing with. You give him a week, and he'll be back in the bars and the brothels. I said, hold on. We're here to help people once they trust the Lord grow in grace. Let's be receiving. Let's just see. Well, a week later... He was riding his bicycle up to Boga Walk where we were leading another Bible school. Every day he rode up about 20 miles and rode back. And in Jamaica, you've got to keep in mind, if you've ever been there, it's up and down and around and around. You can't ride up because the gears were just one gear. 
And you can't go down because they didn't have any coaster brakes on the bicycle, so they walked down the hill. And he spent the rest of the summer following us around Savannah Lamar, to Linstead, wherever we had a Bible school, he came and helped me with the young people. We ran relays and captured the flag and all those kinds of games. We went home, we sent him money, he entered the seminary in Kingston, he became one of the leading pastors in the Jamaica Baptist Union for 40 years. He's in glory now. And people just don't realize a little is a lot in the hands of the Lord. Finally, our God is a God of super abundance. Our God is the God of super abundance. You know, all of us, you remember Paul, Ma and Paul Kettle? way back in the television, anybody want to nod on that? I remember Paul Kettle said it very well. They're sitting at the breakfast, supper table and family had had a little spat. And he said, you know, everybody has some cussedness in them, don't they? Well, you know, he's right. You and I, before Jesus Christ touches our lives, are self-centered. We're hardwired that way. But once Jesus gets a hold of our lives, if any man be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's why we call it the good news. One more story. I preached at Woodmont and in the balcony on the second row there was a guy in a trench coat. As I was preaching, I, I noticed he's a new face. And so at the back door, he comes out, introduces himself, says, my name's Tommy Howard. I said, Tommy, glad to have you. He said, I've been sitting at home and my life's kind of out of pocket now. And I've been watching on television. I thought I'd just come and see. I said, well, I hope you'll come back. Did you sign a visitor's card? No, but I'll be back. He was the next Sunday and the next Sunday. Then he called me on the phone. He said, preacher, could I come visit you? I said, I'd be glad to see you, Tommy. Okay. So he comes, we sit down, we make small talk. And then he said, you know, I just can't seem to get the handle in my life. I've got a great job at Neighbors Trader. In fact, I'm the best trailer salesperson in Davidson County. But I've had some personal issues and I'm not satisfied. Could you give me some help? And I told him the same thing I told Vinny. Tommy, has anybody ever explained to you in language you can understand how you can become a Christian? And he shook his head. I shared with him the gospel. God spoke to his heart. He made a confession of faith that day. He came forward the next Sunday. We baptized him that Sunday night. I was on the home mission board in those years. And I got about two months later, I got on a plane in Atlanta. I was sitting on the aisle and I had pretty wide shoulders and a great big guy looked like Rosie Brown came down the aisle and I thought, oh my gosh, I hope he doesn't sit down here cause I'll be hanging out in the aisle. Well, he did. Well, he turned to me and says, you don't know me, but I know you. And I want to ask you one question. What have you people at Woodmont done to Tommy Howard? He's on time on Mondays. He doesn't have a hangover. He doesn't gamble anymore. He doesn't chase skirts. He doesn't use bad language. What have y'all done to Tommy Howard? And I said, well, friend, we haven't done anything to Tommy Howard, but we did introduce him to somebody that made a difference in his life. Little is a lot in the hands of the Lord, and our God is a God of super abundance. How did we get there? The poet said it well. I'd walk life's way with an easy tread, had followed where comforts and pleasures led, 
until one day in a quiet place I met the Master face to face. With station and rank and wealth for my goal, much thought for my body, but none for my soul, I entered to win in life's mad race when I met the Master face to face. I met him and knew him and blushed to see that his eyes full of sorrow were fixed on me. I bowed and knelt at his feet that day while my castles vanished and melted away. My life is now for the souls of men. I've lost my life to find it again ere since that day in a quiet place. I met the master face to face. In every life, there's a throne and a cross. When self is on the throne, Christ is on the cross. Only when we put Christ on the throne of our hearts and take up our cross and follow him will we ever find meaning and purpose.